athletic trainer here in town that Saunders provides for Wahoo Public, and then I help with a lot of our youth activities that we have in town as well. Um, this is my sister, Elise. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll kind of let her give her background as well. But um, we thought nutrition would be a good topic to talk about. And apparently, we must have hit the nail on the head with something that the community wanted to hear about. But um, just wanted to also thank you for coming. March is National Athletic Training Month. So that was kind of a good thing for us to work in as well as something that I could provide back to our community as an athletic trainer. Um, I've been certified for about 15 years, have been kind of all over the place, um, worked at almost every level uh, from youth sports all the way up to professional sports. So kind of have a large diverse background in the active population and dealing with nutrition. So I'm glad this is something that I could bring to you. And I crowd my sister because she's been a personal trainer for about 12 years now. Um, she's also been a competitive MMA fighter. She's a competitive power lifter. Um, and so that was one of the other nutrition things we've heard about a lot was people wanting to gain weight, not just lose it. And so that's something that she's been really active in as part of her personal life and then obviously her professional life. But you probably give a little bit more background on yourself, so. So yeah, that's pretty much uh, me. But I've been, like uh, Rachel said, I've been a trainer for about 12 years now. And uh, I've been a certified nutritionist for 10 years. And on top of that, I've been an MMA fighter since my early 20s. I started competitive powerlifting. I am a nationally ranked powerlifter as well. I work with my clients to get them not only healthy, but stronger, depending on their specific goals. So I have helped people gain weight, gain muscle. I've helped people lose weight, gain muscle, and everything in between. So yeah, I would consider myself fairly diverse. And if you guys ever have any questions, you know, we're gonna have a couple of points as well, or we can stop and you guys can ask all the questions you want. So don't be shy today. Yes, this whole presentation is what you want to learn. Um, PowerPoint's more to give us a guideline along the way. So if any questions come up, you're more than welcome to ask us or we'll be here at the end um, in addition with the other staff members here to help you out. So um, obviously we're here to learn about tips on healthy habits. Uh, disclaimer, uh, we will be talking about some products, some different websites, apps, books, uh, not getting any financial kickback. That's for those of you that might have done pe professional presentations before. That's one of those things I have to say. So. Um, I'm not getting any financial gains from this. Our opinions are our own. Um, again, I've worked with a wide range of registered dietitians. We are not registered dietitians, just so that you know. So, um, But we've worked with different people, and so this is kind of where our opinions have come from working with all these different ones. So our opinions are our own. They might be completely different than someone else's, and that's okay. If you ever found a profession where they do one thing one way, you probably struck a unicorn because that rarely happens. So, a um, couple of things that I want us to consider as we're getting going. Whether your goal is to lose weight or gain weight, all your good intentions are going to be outdone if you have poor nutrition and poor sleep habits. So, if nothing else, we said that you take away from this is it's going to be getting yourself to drink more fluids and sleep. So, I know that's two of the hardest things that we come by, but. Um, as I had one coach tell me before, which made so, such good sense, it stuck with me, is it doesn't matter what you eat in private, you're gonna wear it in public. So you can convince yourself that you're eating healthy and telling everyone else you're doing these things and that you're doing everything you can, but unfortunately, you know, our body has a way of uh, showing us our lies, if you will. Um, second thing is things are, everything's going to take time. There are no magic bullets. There are no shortcuts that are going to be lasting. So culture has kind of evolved to everyone wants to find that pill, that hack, that shortcut. But really when it comes to healthy living, it's all about full lifestyle changes. And hopefully we can talk about things that you can take long term, not just something that you're going to stick with for two weeks and then just can't stick with it. And consistency is always key. If you do something consistently, it's going to show. So if you are, you know, like Rachel said, if you're eating water and you're sleep, or you're drinking water, or you're sleeping well, and you're eating decently, that's way better than the consistent junk food things like that. So remember that consistency is key. Um, our goal, some of our goals for tonight. Uh, one is we want to use the science, but we don't want to bog you down with it. Um, the hardest thing I've ever had was when I work with a dietitian that'll meet with an athlete 
And they were like, well, you need 0.8 to 1.2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. And I'm just like, I lost you at 0.8. I'm like, <laughs> so what our goal is to give you tips and tricks. Now, if you need to get more into the science, if you're someone that likes to know a little bit more behind it, please feel free to ask. Um, but we're pretty much here just to show you that there's information that we don't need to prove how smart we are by giving you these big fancy terms. Um, and one thing I did want to say is the word chemical is probably going to be used often just because everything in our body is a chemical reaction. And I think there's a lot of fear out there when people talk about, oh, I don't know what this chemical is and this and that. It sounds like a negative, but really we're just a mass made of chemicals and everything that we do is around that. So we're trying not to get any fear mongering or anything going there. Um, second point we want to make, really you should consult your physician. I know that's like the general disclaimer, but just when I work with people, especially when they get that late 20s and hit that early 30s, your body just starts changing. Whether you like it or not, it's gonna start. So seeing your physician can save you a lot of time and frustration. Um, I've worked with a lot of community members here in town that are like, I just can't lose weight and I'm so mad. It's like, well, have you been to your doctor yet? It's like, you know, that's one of those things they just forget. But as you age and as you just change lifestyles, your hormones are gonna change. Um, there's different thyroid conditions that can affect your weight gain or loss. Um, a lot of athletes have electrolyte imbalances. For some reason, there is just certain things that have become so ingrained as bad for you. Salt is bad, sugar is bad, but really that's what our body needs to get going. Your body has a point for all of these. So that's another thing that your physician can help you with. Um, vitamin D levels, that's really huge right now. And especially um, in our area of the country where sunlight is questionable at times, you know, we get 10 minutes today and everyone's so happy and now everyone's wah wah, the clouds are back. Um, vitamin D levels can impact a huge amount on your activity and how your body is functioning. So those are all things that your physician can actually help you out with. And we do have some great physicians right here in our area for us. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up is the mom shaming. And I didn't realize how big this was until I had a mother in our community that was not the type of person I thought was gonna be so touched by this. But she has a high school boy and the kid just can't gain weight for anything. And she's like, all these people keep coming, well, why aren't you feeding him? You should make him eat more. And she's like, I'm, I, I feed my child. She's like, do people really think I don't feed my child? And so that's one of those things that when we're talking about things tonight, we were trying to be helpful. We're not here to criticize you or anything that you're doing. Trust me, it's really hard to parent. I am not a parent, I know. but um, <laughs> I have plenty of nieces and nephews. And I'm gonna tell you, I'm just glad I can give them back at the end of the day. So that's, if you feel like I've touched a nerve on something, please ask, because maybe um, there's a miscommunication in how you're taking something I might say or Elise might say. <clears throat> Um, other things that we want to talk about, credible sources, is everything we're going to talk to you, we have some science, some credibility behind. You can find whatever you want on the internet. And so one, one thing that people love to harass me about is the amount of coffee I consume. consume. They're like, you know, coffee's going to kill you. Oh, coffee's really good for you. I'm like, well, I don't know. I'm either not going to live till I'm 40 or I'm immortal. Depends on what you find on the internet. I'm not quite sure. So again, you can find whatever you want, and I have kids especially love to argue with me on different things when it comes to food. You're gonna find whatever you want out there. So our goal is to give you something that's a little more credible and biased, than unbiased. Uh, other goals that we have tonight, again, those maintainable changes. Um, I think that's the one thing people think is like, I've gotta start my diet. And one of the best things I had people ask is, if you think to yourself, if I'm gonna start a diet tomorrow, what would you eat today? And everything pops in your head, I'm gonna eat cheesecake, I'm gonna eat fries, I'm gonna do this and that. And that's why diets don't work, is because they just put this big <coughs> mind game on you. So we wanna do stuff that can help you do maintainable changes. We're not here to change your life, we're just maybe hopefully to make it a little easier. Um, talk about, we're gonna talk about steps versus the all or nothing mentality. Um, and give you a little more confidence just when it comes to food and nutrition. Food's really not that scary, but sometimes it just gets built up in our mind to be scary. Um, with that, realistic expectations. 
Um, we're gonna talk about a few things because that's the other thing. No matter how much I want to be 5'10", I'm not going to be 5'10". I'm done growing. So there's certain things that we can expect and not expect. Um, the last part, which we're going to go into a little more in depth, is genetics. You'll hear that all the time. Well, I'm nothing I can do. I just come from a family that's overweight. I come from a big boned family. Believe it or not, we all have the same bone density. Not going to happen. Um, but there are things that we can't control, and that's the other thing we want to get into. Um, your body type is going to influence your changes, and chemical makeup, again, is going to be vastly different than even your closest relative. So we're gonna dig in a little more on that one. So if you ever wonder what you do with that information from Ancestry.com, this is what you can do with it. <laughs> yes, yeah. so this is a sample of our family. Um, so might be pretty obvious, but I brought my wonderful ginger sister here. Hello. And so you can, if you wanna guess one, two, three, or four, if you think which one is her Ancestry.com makeup. Do we do a raise hand? Does anyone think it's one? Am I two? Three, or four. All right, I am actually number four. So this is just a good example of, you just have no idea how your body is made up. So when my mom tested Elise, she was thinking, oh, she for sure got all the Irish Absolutely. in her. And then we tested another sister who looks maybe a little more like me, but has a little more darker complexion, darker everything. And we were shocked that Elise comes back and she's barely Irish. Hardly a thing in there. So that just kind of proves to you that you can make all these assumptions about yourself when really we don't quite know exactly. But it was a fun way to kind of use that data. Oh, absolutely. I'll start too. So piggybacking off of the genetics, there are three different type of major body types out there. We have the ectomorphs, endomorphs, and mesomorphs. So ectomorphs are going to be the people who are tall, skinny, you kind of get jealous of them because they seem to not be able to gain weight. Um, the endomorphs are going to be the curvy people, more like the Kim Kardashian, Scarlett Johansson. They have wide shoulders, but also wide hips, and then a tend to be smaller stomach. And the mesomorphs are the genetic freaks who just maintain their awesome musculature no matter what they do. Now each of these have a different way to gain weight to lose weight. For ectomorphs, it is very frustrating for them to gain weight. And I actually had a client who was an ectomorph and she was a six foot one blonde bombshell, legs up to here, but she was frustrated because she couldn't gain that muscle. And then anytime people said, oh, you're so lucky, you're so skinny, it actually really hurt her feelings because she was trying so hard to gain that muscle. Now for endomorphs, it's easy for endomorphs to gain weight, but it's also easy for endomorphs to lose weight. And then for mesomorphs, again, it's easier for them to gain weight only if they kind of stop paying attention, but the second they're back in the gym, they're gonna be tightening up, toning a lot easier than the rest of them. So kind of think about what you may be. If you're tall, skinnier, you're gonna be an ectomorph. If you're an endomorph, you're gonna have more of a curved body. And even at your uh, more muscular, you're still going to have soft curves. The mesomorphs are going to be the more ripped people. They're gonna be easily gaining muscle. You're going to see a lot more definition and they tend to be a little more up and down as opposed to the curve. So. Um, and this was a good slide that Dylan put together for us is that there's a certain amount of body fat that humans are meant to have. It has a purpose. And yes, ladies, we do have more body fat, but we also create little human beings. So it does serve a purpose. And one thing that um, I thought was important that he pointed out was as your age goes up, that normal body fat percentage goes up as well. That's a natural part of aging. Um, so a couple things to keep in mind here, a lot of the questions we'll get sometimes as well, you know, why can't I get that six pack? And you don't understand that you have to get way down into these body fat percentages. Uh, the other thing that comes with this is you can't spot reduced fat. So you can't be like, okay, I'm just gonna start doing crunches left and right to get rid of this, this tire around my abdomen. Your body just doesn't work that way. So when you lose fat, you're gonna generally lose it from your entire body. Now you can work on musculature underneath of that fat, but when it comes to that spot reducing, that's one of those unfortunate misconceptions out there. The other thing we're gonna talk about, just touch on a little bit, because it's very 
very touchy to certain people, is the BMI versus body composition. Um, BMI, in my opinion, is very old school. Is it takes your age, your height, and your weight and tells you if you're fit or obese. Um, and one of Elisa's favorite stories is, is her and all the personal trainers at her gym wanted to go skydiving, but the company went off BMI and they were all morbidly obese and couldn't go. None um, of us could. I <laughs> had my coworkers of six packs, but they couldn't go because we were all morbidly obese and could not jump with the person. But if you look yeah. at us, and you, especially the guys, they got six packs, they're running around with their shirts off, and everyone was shocked when we like told them the story. So, so when you're looking at truly what your makeup is, that body composition and body fat is going to give you a truer representation of your health. Okay, it's that ratio of of the bone density to your muscle to your body fat. So just one of those things that if you look at a BMI in a, an article um, on the internet, anything like that, you just kind of it takes a hit to your self-esteem. Just know that that's one way of measuring your health, but not necessarily the only way. And when it comes to your, uh, if you wanna find out your body fat, any trainer can take it for you. We'll either do through an electric, either hold or you're gonna stand on something that's electric. We'll either do a pinch test, and so we literally just pinch how much fat you have on there, or we can do a water distillation, but you have to go to, I think UNO is the only place in Nebraska that does that. So, you know, just some ways, if you guys are curious, you can touch base with any of the trainers here and see what you can do to take your body fat. All right, so now we're gonna get some foundational questions. So these are some of the things that everything, whether you wanna lose, gain, maintain, are kind of all based on. And so one, calories in versus calories out is kind of what it comes down to. Uh, I, I did put the one fancy science term up there of the basic basal metabolic rate. So just know that there are a certain amount of calories you need just to exist. And there's all sorts of different calculators out there to find it. So it's not one of those things where I ate 800 calories, so I'm gonna exercise off 800 calories. You're never gonna be at zero. There's a certain amount of calories your body needs just to function. And then in versus out. So if you eat more calories than you expel, that's gonna cause you to gain the weight. If you have more calories being burned that are consumed, that's when we look at losing weight. Um, other point that, that's kind of the basic, food quality and food preparation. So this is one where we've talked about before, we're very lucky in the area that we live. We have a lot of farm fresh food, we have a lot of um, available resources to us that are not so processed. Um, so that's one of the good things about that as well. I know you wanted to talk about some of that preparation and quality as well. Oh, absolutely. When it comes to the quality of your food, I always tell this to my clients, of course, in a perfect world, we're gonna eat free range, we're gonna eat organic, we're gonna eat all of the stuff. But at the same time, if you're going from eating uh, McDonald's to eating uh, deli meats that you find, that's way better. So yeah, we do wanna keep it more fresh. We wanna keep that quality of food because that is gonna fuel your body in the most beneficial way. Yes. And again, we're in a good area. So finding your, your buddy farmer that's got chickens is way easier. When I lived in Seattle, I was spending six bucks for a dozen eggs just to get something that wasn't, I know, exactly. Well, she's not but, exaggerating. That's I know. Thing. So yeah. And I can't even tell you what I spent on milk either without making myself sick. So we are very lucky around here that we have those resources. We have the farmer's markets. We have those produce stands. Well, you do protein. Protein, protein is the most important thing when it comes to fueling your muscles, fueling your body. The reason that protein is so needed in your body, and I'm just gonna get sciencey for like one second here. So there are called macronutrients. So we have everything has proteins, carbs, and fat. Okay, so those are the three things that make up all food. The only one of those protein, carbs, and fat that has nitrogen in it is protein. And your body, in order to gain muscle, has to be in a nitro, uh, nitrogen positive state. So that's why protein is so important. That's the only way that you can truly fuel your muscles to grow and in turn burn that fat. Yes. So that's one of those things again, you gotta feed the muscle to burn the fat. And so that's where we get in with a lot of females that I'm afraid to lift because I don't wanna get bulky. Well, you might have an initial bulk 
but it's going to be that muscle that helps burn that fat. So even if it's just a daily improvement in strength training, there's so many benefits to strength training for your bone health, for your joint health. So that's kind of where that protein comes in. Yeah. And to kind of piggyback off that too, um, you know, I have clients that come to me and they want to gain muscle with females. But, um, you know, they'll look at my legs and be like, well, I don't want to get that thick. Well, you have to be squatting 360 pounds consistently in order to get that type of, you know, body that you want. So, I mean, if you guys are in the gym and you guys are weight training, it is way more beneficial than it is to be on the treadmill for 30 minutes. So keep that in mind as well. Um, other thing, clean your plate through. Um, that's one of those deals where I think a lot of people are raised, especially in the Midwest, Whatever's on your plate, you're gonna finish. Who, who was on the clean the plate crew? Oh yes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, and it's it's interesting. Um, one one book, if you ever wanna talk about your relationship with food, this is one book I will recommend. It's called Intuitive Eating. Um, and it says it's a program, but really it's more just a good way of explaining nutrition and diet and your relationship with food or your point of view on food. Um, it was written by two um, registered dietitians that just kind of explains why diets don't work. And I loved this because I was reading things, and this is my copy, and as I've read it through the years, I have um, highlights and pigtails, either talking about our family or the athletes I work with, things that recognize. And one thing it talked about with the Clean Your Plate crew was that struck me was, okay, so you look at how you were raised. So then you go back another generation. So my mother was raised by my grandmother who grew up during the depression and on a farm very you know not wealthy at all so food was very important so why would you waste food so that's how my mother was always raised was you don't waste food you don't waste food you don't waste food which in turn came to us you don't waste food you don't waste food now there were seven of us growing up so you know at that point sometimes it was a competition for food especially when you had a brother that could eat my parents out of house and home so yeah. um, that clean your plate crew thing is can be good and bad one, um, it's good because you should recognize what your body needs to consume to maintain your goals. It can be bad because most people will overeat. Um, our brother had a friend from Poland, I believe, and he used to call it American full. He'd get American full. And he's like, you know, full is when you just feel like, okay, I'm good. That was a good meal. American full is when you're like, oh my gosh, I can't move. I need to let, sit back and relax. So that's the other negative thing about that clean your plate. And so that's one thing that we're gonna kind of talk about a little bit is how to maybe change that frame of mind to get to some healthier habits. And with that is portion sizes. So one thing that we talk about is how visual we are as human beings. And so the clean your plate portion sizes. So if you're at a family reunion just at home and you have a paper plate that's this big, you're gonna fill it up and eat it. And you'll probably be fine. But then you might have a plate this big and you're gonna fill it up and eat it and you're gonna be fine or American full. And so, you know, when one plate can fit into another, that's just one of those simple tricks to get to what your goals are. If your goals are to lose weight, try to aim for a smaller plate, then you'll visually be full. If your goal is to gain, get a bigger plate and that lets you know that you're getting a little bit bigger portion size there. And then the last thing that's kind of the basic thing as we go to and the hardest one, I get a lot of cringes, is the drinking your calories. Um, it's consistently the hardest lifestyle struggle of people because what's the first thing I should do, Rachel? If I only do one thing, I'm like, stop drinking soda. And people are like, but I can't, I can't make it through the day without my Diet Coke. I can't make it through my day. I'm like, okay, that's called addiction. But, <laughs> but it's definitely one of the hardest things because the, the, they're easy to drink, they taste good, all sorts of things. I'm a water, coffee, tea, are probably your best options person. Absolutely. Um, and then we'll get into sports drinks a little bit later. But um, yeah, Anytime I have a client that comes to me and says, well, I'm drinking diet, no. That's half the time, most of the time, worse for you because those chemicals, your body doesn't know what to do with that. Your body knows what to do with sugar. Sugar is sugar. Your body doesn't know what to do with aspartame, which is you know, the, the processed zero calorie sugar that's in Diet Coke, Diet Pepsi, and then it turns it directly into fat. So if you find yourself trying to lose weight and you're struggling, what are you drinking? Are you drinking that Diet Coke? Is everything settling right in the stomach? Because that's normally what happens with those. So 
I like to kick people off of the pop, off of the diet pop, off of the energy drinks, and get them addicted to black tea, green tea, water, things like that, that are actually going to still give you that kind of buzz, but not be harmful to your weight loss journey. And that's one of those tips too, is, uh, you know, it's funny you tell people to switch from diet to a regular, and then try to wean off the regular. So it's one of those things like, again, get to a, a process that your body knows, sugar, and then, okay, let's, let's stop the big gulp. Maybe let's have, you know, just the bottle of, of Pepsi, Dr. Pepper, my vice, and then let's drop down to a can. And now kind of nicely, they have those little cans back. So I remember those used to be a treat growing up. We'd come to the Wahoo Warehouse, always used to have the little cans. So those are coming back. So you can wean yourself off of that. Again, the cold turkey thing is hard. Um, Victoria, what did you say on the body doesn't, on the diet drinks, the body doesn't know what to do with it, so that converts back to fat? Directly to fat. Really? So your liver is the processing center of your entire body. So you put things like sugar in it, it knows what to do with it. You even put things like alcohol in it, it's stuck, it's kind of like, well, I don't like that, and it's gonna turn that to fat. So if it's a real thing, if it's like tea, water, um, coffee even, if it can process that and direct it to where it's supposed to go. But when you throw a chemical like aspartame into it, it's like, okay, I don't know what to do with that, put it into fat. <coughs> And there's a lot of different research out on, on good and bad, and it's, it's fluctuated from it's, it's severely bad to there have been some studies that show that those art, artificial sweeteners um, have led to diarrhea, which is probably the least favorite, and some artificial sweeteners were taken off the market because that was a side effect. Mm -hmm. um, there is you, the debate on does it, is it linked to type 2 diabetes? But I think that kind of goes into your whole diet versus is it just the artificial sweetener? Yeah. Um, and then there's others that show that it has an addictive property to it. That that's one reason like I can't live without my Diet Coke is there's some more research being done every day on is it really actually signaling a reaction in your brain that I need more of it, I need more of it. So Would the same hold true for like your Splenda and your coffee? So fun fact about Splenda, the way that Splenda came into existence is they were trying to create rat poison. And, it, and this is a true story. When they created Splenda, they were trying to create rat poison. It fell into someone's coffee, made it sweet, and didn't kill them. So yes, it is the same true for Splenda. Now, if you want to go a little more natural, Truvia, they're not finding too many negative side effects of like Truvia. And uh, Sativa, they're, or uh, Sativa, like Stavia. Stavia, Stavia, thank you. Yeah. Um, they're kind of trying to see more into that, seeing what's happening with your body on those. So, I mean, when it comes to zero calorie sweeteners, I'm not a fan in general. The least of the evils would be like Truvia. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'll let Elise talk a little bit about this. I made this slide intentionally annoying because I find diets annoying, so I'll kind of <laughs> let her talk about it. So as a trainer throughout the years, and even as myself, uh, when I was an adolescent, when I was in elementary school, I was chubby. I was never obese, but I was always chubby. And I got obsessed at a very young age with diet, 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 what's going to work, what's going to work. As I became older, I'm seeing this in so many other people too, and it's so frustrating because it's like you want something that works. And I want to tell everyone right now, what works for you may not work for another person, and that's okay. Diets, nutrition, everything is very personal. So up here, yeah, it looks very overwhelming. The keto, intermittent fasting, gluten-free, Atkins, South Beach, high carb, paleo, everything. It seems like a lot. Has anyone in here, how many of you have actually tried one of these diets? Anyone? Okay, we don't have to raise your hand, that's fine. <laughs> so there is a difference, though, between a fad diet and an elimination diet. So when we talk about a fad diet, what a fad diet is is something that's not supposed to be maintainable. You're supposed to only do it for maybe a week, maybe a month, maybe two months. If you are a competitive bodybuilder, you're gonna do it for about 12 weeks and then that's it. You're gonna be on off season and then try again next season, okay? What, um, so specifically with a fad diet, it can be things like what's called the military diet, and the only reason it's called the military diet is because it sucks that bad. <laughs> and it's that hard. And it's the weird things like you have tuna on a cracker with a half of a banana, it's crazy. It's the dumbest thing ever. I hate fad diets. Now elimination diets, 
that would be your uh, paleo, your Atkins, your keto, your high carb, and your gluten free. Um, so when it comes to an elimination diet, what that means is you're taking an entire category of food and you're eliminating it. So when it comes to, let's talk about keto and paleo and Atkins, you're eliminating a lot of carbohydrates, okay? So why it works for some but not others. Remember back when we were talking about those three different body types, the ectomorph, endomorph, mesomorph. Every single one of those body types, something different is going to work for those body types. For me, I'm an endomorph, so what works for me is not gonna work for an ectomorph. Um, and then long-term versus short-term. When I talk about these elimination diets, Everyone thinks, oh, I'm gonna go gluten-free this month. I'm gonna do paleo this month. That's a lifestyle change. That is a full-on lifestyle that you are going to have. And granted, you might have a cheat day here and there, but you're supposed to have that until the day you're no longer here. So um, are, there, are these different protocols beneficial? Yes, for some people, but not for everyone. For example, my dad, our dad, he just beat, uh, working on beating stage four cancer. And so he decided to eliminate all processed sugar, all processed foods, and he essentially went paleo. And that was for a specific health reason. So the health reasons are going to be different than the vanity reasons as well. I just threw a lot at you. Any questions on those specifically? Okay, so we'll hash that out a little bit. And so some of the potential pitfalls when it comes to athletes and active people. Um, the low carbohydrate consumption. Again, a lot of the diets tell you carbs are bad, get rid of them completely, um, or go so low. But if you're a very active person or you're dealing with someone that's an actual athlete, energy is where the carbs come from. And that um, when you get rid of that, then all of a sudden that fatigue starts to set in. We see increases in injury risk. Um, you increase your cramping. Um, poor focus, mood, cognition, all those things, because again, your brain needs the sugar, the carbohydrates to function. So at minimum, they recommend that about 130 grams, again, that's what the beautiful food label's for, just so that your brain functions. Um, and this slide, and there's a lot of information on the sportsrd.org, is one of my favorite sites to go. It's the Collegiate and Professional Sports Dietitians Association. Um, but these are, it's a credible website, it's the best of the best, and everything up there is really geared toward the active and the athletes. Um, the other problem is low sodium consumption. Again, salt and sodium has gotten this really bad rap because while it is bad for a sedentary person or maybe your average older individual, athletes need sodium. When they sweat, so every time your son comes home and he's got this nasty shirt that has a white ring around it, that's what he's sweating out, that's that salt. And so that's why it's very important to get that. Uh, other thing are those fasting periods. You're way more better at talking about fasting periods than me, but for what I see from a health standpoint is if you're going so low on your carbohydrates and you're not fueling properly, that's when I see kids start to pass out, feel lightheaded, dizzy, those sort of things. And so while certain diets you know, when certain athletes will do fasting periods, in general, it's kind of one of the more dangerous things to do. So um, that's where the trendy uh, diets for athletes are a little bit difficult. Consult your doctor. Yes, yeah. exactly. Call, talk to someone that knows what they're talking about. Um, questions so far? Again, that's just kind of some fundamentals and we'll roll into things, but yes. What's the difference between a nutritionist and a registered dietitian? So, good yeah, so good. So registered dietitians, um, are licensed healthcare professionals. So like I'm a licensed healthcare professional, I'm an athletic trainer. Um, Elise cannot call herself an athletic trainer because she does not have those credentials. Um, however, she is a certified nutritionist. So she has taken certain courses by certain bodies to become a certified nutritionist. But like in the eyes of the law, um, registered dietitians are the only ones that can legally tell you what to put in your body. Now other people can give you advice that have had experience but uh, registered dietitians, that's like your physician. You know, so physicians, and then you have your physician assistant right. who operates underneath a physician. Same thing, you have the registered dietitians and then nutritionists, or um, there's a couple other fun terms. They're kind of below that accreditation level. 
So what would one help me with versus the other? I mean, why would I see a dietitian versus a nutritionist? Um, nutritionists are really good at basic information, and they could probably get into the higher level stuff. Okay. A registered dietitian guarantees you that they have met certain legal standards and certain accreditation standards, um, so that you you for sure know that they have a valid credential. So there are anyone could hop on the internet and become a certified nutritionist in something. Registered dietitians they've had the education and the continuing edu education, and that's a very common question. That's why we threw that disclaimer. We are not registered. And then also, if you're ever working with a personal trainer, we're great. We're here to help you. But at the same time, we cannot medically diagnose you with things. So if you, you know, twist your ankle, I have to send you to Rachel to tell you what you did. I can say, I think you have done this, but I cannot give you medical advice. I can work with your athletic trainer, which I have done in the past, work with athletic trainer to rehab someone. So yeah, there's just different categories of those. Yeah. Any other questions so far? All right, we're getting to the nitty gritty now. So fueling your activity. And so that's one thing that we talked about with active individuals. Um, a lot of the times when I'm dealing with kids at the high school level, yes, I can deal with all sorts of injuries, but a lot of the things come back to, well, did you eat before practice? Did you eat after practice? And those sort of things. So we'll kind of hash that out now. Again, this is from that website, the Sports RD. They have great information and very simple and clear because again, they're collegiate and professional people that deal with collegiate professional athletes. Not all of them are the sharpest tool in the shed. So they make sure to do things very, very clearly and they do a great job. Um, but before that workout, you wanna make sure that you're getting those carbohydrates and a moderate amount of protein. Your body takes a little bit longer to, to digest protein, so you wanna make sure you're not having a full steak with that before you work out. You wanna focus on foods that are low in fiber and fat. Again, your body needs a little bit longer to process those, so as you're getting ready for a workout, you don't want your stomach still working on those. Um, length and intensity of the, of the workouts matter. So if you're someone that's just active, you go to the gym for 20, 30 minutes a day, it's gonna be a little bit different than you're heading to football practice, you're heading to volleyball practice, those sort of things. So you really need to take that into consideration. Um, those morning workouts, always, that's when I get a lot of questions, and that's when I see a lot of issues surrounding nutrition, is kids are lightheaded, dizzy, they don't feel good. Well, that's because there was a 6 a.m. practice, so it takes me eight minutes to get to school, two minutes to put my shoes on. Okay, so I'm gonna leave exactly this time and they didn't eat anything. So getting your kids in good habits of having a snack, whether it's a bar, um, some people process liquids better and they get just a quick little shake or even a juice or milk, something in their body before a workout is very important. Um, and then they need to experiment. I wish I could tell you exactly what every person needs for that morning workout, but again, it's individual. I'm one, I don't do well with solid food. If I'm doing a morning workout, I need a liquid. Um, but other people need bordering on a full breakfast for them to function for a morning workout. So that's just one of those basic ones to know. So if you're looking at exercise, and again, if, let's take this from the athlete standpoint, three to four hours before exercise, you wanna have that small meal. And this is what's gonna kind of prime the pump and fuel you. So that's when you're looking at sandwich. Um, we get a lot of kids in town that use Subway. You add a piece of fruit to that and you know whether it's milk or a sports drink, something that's gonna give you some substance. Um, and then the hydration part is really the big thing. So you start to pump those fluids in you at that three to four hour mark. And then another 30 to 60 minutes is again, we need to start refueling a little bit. So why this is really important, especially if you've got high schoolers, is if you think about their day. So Wahoo Public, you're either eating lunch at 11.48 or 12.36, I believe. So let's say you ate and you're done with your food at 12.15 and you have a game at 7 p.m. You know, that's a long time to go. And especially if you're dealing with teenagers, let alone teenage boys, that lunch is gone before the end of the school day. So that's where they need to look at having a meal right after school and then a small snack to kind of help compensate for that. At the same time, you look at some of these other sports. So you can eat lunch at noon, but then we have a 4.30 baseball game. And so they're gonna need something that's a little bit smaller that they, they can sit a little bit better for them. 
Um, and so that's where you always look at keeping those snacks. Granola bars, pretzels are great, fruit, that sort of thing for them to get into. Um, we'll touch a little bit later on sports drinks because, again, that's another thing that kind of got vilified for some reason, and they're really not bad. All right, during your exercise and activity, again, workouts matter. Um, so you want to make sure that while you're working out, you're still fueling your body as you need. So when you look at the exercise timing, if it's less than that 45 minutes um, or you're not going to be doing anything too long, too grueling, you know, just focus on that water for hydration. You're probably not going to need that extra fuel. Um, but that when you start to get to that 45 minutes to over an hour, hour and a half, um, that's when you want to look at sustaining your energy. So we get that a lot in the stop and start sports. Uh, Halftime is really a huge chance for you to get a little bit more back in your body. Um, and use those sports drinks. Um, I'm always a big fan of keeping snacks in your locker so that if you do need something, again, you've got to kind of experiment, it's right there. So I know football season, we have fruit in the locker room at halftime. Um, it was something that they just did before I got here when it was hot out. But it's like, no, that's a great thing to keep all year. Because again, you're burning at such a high rate, you need to refuel. Um, even volleyball this season is, you know, our girls did a great job, except that all their games were only going to three sets. And so then we get later in the season where they're having to go five, and you just literally saw them all go white face and tank. So that's why we started to introduce Gatorade for those games. And at state, because it was, again, keeping those energy levels up. And sometimes it is those small things that are a huge competitive advantage. So the Gatorade and the small snacks in their lockers and their bags are a great thing to have. And then endurance exercises. So that's when we're going for an hour, two and a half hours. Um, and that can either be you know, a full soccer game, football game. It can be one of Coach Foster's practices. You know, They are a really long, grueling uh, workout, and that's something they need to keep in mind. So for those trying to gain weight or maintain it, it's really important they're getting food during that period in time. So um, for if I'm a non-fruit eater or mm -hmm. not a very good fruit eater, like what is your take on like beef jerky? That would be his go-to healthy snack. Beef jerky is, personally, I think it's great. It's a real easy, it's a pretty clean food, if you will, if we want to start talking in those terms. The only problem is it's only protein, is we're not getting enough carbs with that. And so, you know, the, the beef jerky with maybe a few pretzels. Uh, pretzels are great. Um, I've even been to, to there's division one programs that use Rice Krispie treats because it's sugar, it's quick sugar and slower sugar. So those, and again, if we're dealing with teenagers, let them eat. Like really, they're gonna burn that stuff off. So whatever they need, but maybe where it's something where they're very protein. Our brother is hates sweets. It's really kind of funny. Mm -hmm. Loves sweets. He hates them. So he's a very savory person. So that's where he'd be more the pretzels, you know, beef jerky, that sort of thing, versus a fruit or something sweet. Um, also kind of with the sports drinks, we do have some kids that just don't like Gatorade. They feel like it was that pasty, chalky mouth feel. Um, I've used apple juice a lot with athletes. Some um, registered dietitians are against that because it, some people give stomach cramps. So again, you have to experiment <laughs> what works for you. Um, but one di registered dietitian, she was awesome, very helpful, but she was like, we use coconut water would be the next thing to do with that. I'm like, you're gonna want me to tell a high school boy to drink coconut water? <laughs> like, I won't do it and I know it serves a purpose. So, so there's, again, you gotta work with what they'll let you do. And another great one would be Pedialyte. Mm -hmm. So in the world of powerlifting, when you're depleting yourself and then you have to quick gain your weight back and you have to quick gain your uh, hydration back, Pedialyte's a great source as well. And again, that's what your goal is. So Pedialyte is again, because it's made for babies with diarrhea, really, um, and then Gatorade is formulated from the athlete standpoint, but you've got to look at the calorie consumption between the both. So like we'll use it a lot with the wrestlers, Pedialyte, because it's lower in calories, but they're getting that fuel they need. But if you have an athlete that's a heavy sweater, it's okay, they don't need to shy away from those, those sports drinks. And then the recovery part. This is the one that probably bangs my head against the wall the most with kids, is you need to eat after you work out. And again, between just an active individual, you might be okay to do a workout and then wait till you get home and make dinner. 
If we're dealing with someone on the athlete standpoint, I'm a huge fan of getting food as soon as you can after a workout. So again, bars, you know, trail mix, something in their bag that they can get something in their body right away. Because they spent all this time breaking their body down, they need something to replenish everything they just used. And then, so we're looking at that 15 to 60 minutes after uh, a workout. I'm, I'd even lean more toward that half hour mark, 20 to 30 minutes, making sure they get something in there. Um, chocolate milk is actually great. It's protein and carbohydrates. It's got that sugar that's gonna re refuel them. Um, anything that they can get right away, I'm a big fan of. And then we can look at this training table, obviously collegiate, uh, but when they get home, then they can look at their dinner. So I always say, your post-workout snack is we're just rebuilding what we just tore down. Dinner is we're building on our success. So that's kind of why I'm a big fan. Um, if they do, if you do multiple workouts in a day, whether you're an active person or again have an athlete that might have, um, you know, track practice right after school, but then they have club basketball or club volleyball later on, that window between the two events is huge because we have to repair from that one workout and we got to get ready for another one. So that's other things to kind of keep an eye on. Um, and some people just aren't hungry after working out and that's okay, um, but you want to play around. It, again, is a liquid, is a protein shake going to sit with you better than maybe a, a whole um, solid food. Okay. And then I want to touch on sugar because um, Again, it's another thing that's kind of been vilified in our society for good reasons, because people make these delicious things that are packed with it. But a couple things I want to touch on. Um, Nancy Clark, RD, she's uh, probably one of the original registered dietitians, and she's done a lot for the field. Um, and I really like what she has to say, because again, it's very simple terms. Um, but she wrote this article that I've taken a few bullet po points from, because this was right after I had one of our heaviest sweaters in basketball season be like, I'm like, why are you drinking Pedialyte? And he's like, too much sugar in Gatorade. I'm like, oh no, you need that sugar. Um, and so a couple different things with this. One, I, I did the good for anyone that knows, you guys probably don't know what Spy versus Spy is, but that's okay. If you want, go back in time. Um, <laughs> but sugar versus high fructose corn syrup, I die with this one because they're basically the same thing. Um, when you look at their chemical makeup, um, but you know, you get the sugar industry that says no, um, high, fruit corn syrup, high fructose corn syrup is bad. They're, those evil corn farmers are out to get you. And I actually read an article that took, said that. I'm like, oh yeah, a lot of evil corn farmers around here. <laughs> um, so really when it breaks down to the, the sugar versus high fructose corn syrup, it's more looking at what you're consuming and how much of it is probably when it breaks down into what's really bad. Um, but athletes respond to sugar very different than an unfit person. And you can actually get quite a few calories from your sugar um, just through normal food. So you don't have to think about it. However, when it talks about that 60 to 80 grams, again, we get into the numbers, you can eat quite a bit of food and get sugar, or you can have one soda and you hit that. So again, when you're looking at that soda thing, I will vilify soda, that's okay. Um, that's but okay. you can eat quite a bit of carbs and processed food. But again, look at that whole food diet. Chocolate milk, when you look at it, has 22 grams of sugar. Well, 12 of them are, occur naturally. That's just what milk is. And then that added sugar, again, is more fuel for your muscles. But you're also at the same time getting protein, calciums, and vitamin D and other nutrients. Um, so that's one of those things I just wanted to touch on with sugar is in the context of being active, it's not as evil. In the context of weight loss and weight gain and what you consume and how much of it, that's when it starts to be a problem. Uh, injury recovery, uh, just touch on this a little bit. I have parents ask me all the time when someone gets hurt, what can I do? Um, food is actually a great thing. So concussions, again, concussions, if you ever look at a picture of it, you just, it's chemicals flying everywhere. And so what can you do? Food is really important with the concussion. So normally if I have a kid that has a concussion and I talk to the parents, I'm like make sure they hydrate and they get a good meal because your body's gonna need that to repair, just like any other injury. Um, there are a lot of studies that are backing omega-3 fatty acids. Um, so there's a lot of uh, supplements out there geared for concussion and concussion preventions that have had good research. Um, and that's one of those things when we talk about source of your food. Um, so fish, great source for omega-3s. 
the problem is we're now getting a lot of farm fish versus um, free fish, if you will, um, the fresh fish. And so the farm raised fish doesn't have as much omega threes. So if you're gonna spend the money on fish, you wanna kind of keep an eye on that. Otherwise they do have supplements that's way easier and a lot of people don't like fish. Um, and also increase that protein because again, that protein synthesis, the building blocks, that's what it is. Um, surgery, you're in the reparative state. A lot of the kids I get are like, well, I don't wanna gain weight. I don't wanna gain weight when I have surgery. And yes, you're gonna be more sedentary but crunching around takes about two to three times more energy than just walking. So a lot of people actually need additional ones. And then avoid the inflammatory foods. So greasy foods, fried foods, excess cheese, soda are all inflammatory foods. And when you've had a surgery and you're swollen, you want to avoid anything that might go into that. Um, ligaments, again, chemical and force dependent. So a lot of the times we talk about ACLs when we talk about ligaments. Protein and copper for girls during their cycle has been proven beneficial. Uh, in certain studies, but you wanna look at collagen and vitamin C. So you probably wouldn't think about drinking gelatin, but there's like gelatin smoothies, just like in Jell-O, that has been shown to help increase and, and protect our ligaments. Um, bone, health and healing, the calcium, again, especially in heavy sweaters, that's one of those that we sweat out, the vitamin D, vitamin K, and proteins. And again, if you're injured, that's a great time to talk to your doctor about if you might need some of these extra things. Um, weight loss, we'll kind of go through this. I always talk about wrestling as sorcery. Don't tell me why you can eat the exact same thing as your wrestling son and he can go and work out for two hours and you can barely function during the day. Okay, so they have just a little different, again, we're looking at high metabolism guys. Um, it's just a mentality thing that they really do. So I get a lot of moms that are like, why can't I be like my son? Um, fluids, again, increasing that water intake. There's no magical water the alkaline water, the black water, the, we were talking about this the other day, the new trend is raw water, and I'm like, yes, the Oregon Trail called that dysentery, but if you think it's a trend, great. <laughs> um, but when weight loss, again, if you can cut out those drinks that aren't related to your workouts, you cut out the sodas, the energy drinks, that is gonna be huge when it comes to weight loss, mainly because it'll cut down on that bloat feeling as well. Um, hungles, hunger signals and cravings, that's another huge thing, is you need to learn to respond to your body and eat when you're hungry. So I call it the toddler effect. So if you're hungry and you just keep pushing it off, keep pushing it off, two things will happen. Your body's gonna shut down because it's like, okay, I, 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 I don't have food, I, I need to shut down to save my energy, and then you just can't get it going again. That's the, the kid that lays on the floor and refuses to move from the middle of the grocery store. Then you get the second effect of it is like, fine mom, you're not gonna listen to me, I'm gonna throw a temper tantrum. And next thing you know, when you are ready to eat, you're just gonna start eating everything. And that's where you've really gotta pay attention to those hunger signals and at least acknowledge it, have a little snack or something. And then fighting cravings also often leads to consuming more calories. Um, that was one of the great examples in the book was like, I want a piece of chocolate cake. So you're like, okay, well I'm gonna have this, and then I'm gonna have this, and then I'm gonna have this. <clears throat> But because you're trying to fulfill a craving and you're ignoring it. The next thing you know, you've eaten more calories than if you just had the piece of chocolate cake. So when it comes to losing weight, it's okay to eat those splurge foods, just do it in moderation. Um, other things, we've had the debate back and forth ourselves with breakfast. I'm a big, you should eat within 30 minutes of waking up. Um, Elise talks about how she feels better with a little bit of intermittent fasting. Um, so again, what works best for you and your body? Um, but a little pre-workout snack, if you are gonna work out in the morning, followed by breakfast, seems generally recommended. Um, tips for snacks, keep the burn going. You wanna keep your metabolism, that chemical reaction in your body going. So their snacks are meant to be in between meals. So a snack isn't a mini meal. A snack is just a little something, a little extra calories to get you going. Um, we've talked before, eating before bed. Again, that's dependent. Some people, if you go to bed hungry, you're gonna shut and slow your system down. It's more, what do you eat before bed? Do you have like some baby carrots or do you have you know, a milkshake? Those are gonna be two different things. Sleep is gonna be huge. You need to sleep to lose weight. And I know that's hard, but if you can carve out a little extra sleep time, your body is just gonna be more responsive to everything else you're doing. And again, the emotion of eating food is a lot of people that lose weight get in that cycle of, okay, I need to eat this way, I didn't eat this way, I failed, why try? 
And I think I hear that more often. So that's why we talked about those little steps along the way. All right, I'm going to weight gain, which is very actually, if you think about it, kind of similar to weight loss. What both have in common is calories in versus calories out. If you are in a caloric deficit, you are going to lose weight. If you eat more calories than you're burning, you're going to gain weight. And that's just kind of basic science, basic math. Nutrient dense food versus calorie dense food. The difference between a calorie dense food and a nutrient dense food. I can have a uh, eight ounce sirloin for the same amount of calories that I can have the Snickers. Which one's gonna be better for you? Which one's gonna fuel me better is going to be that steak. Now when you're trying to gain weight, we have protein, we have carbohydrates, we have fat. You absolutely need carbohydrates, which is the number one source that your body's gonna go to to burn first. You need those carbohydrates to be in an excess, meaning, okay, I can, my body can reserve the protein, can reserve the fat because I am all set on those carbohydrates. And that's kind of how you start gaining weight. So they are important, even when you're losing weight, even when you're an adult and you're just trying to kind of tighten up there is a certain amount of carbohydrates that are gonna be very beneficial for you. Sleep and eating. Uh, you are not a gremlin, you can eat after midnight. And that's exactly what Rachel was talking about. So for me personally, and I'm gonna do a lot of personal stories because I think weight loss and weight gain is a very personal story. For me, I do intermittent fasting, meaning that about seven o'clock at night, I stop eating and then I won't eat again for 16 hours, which sounds a lot more difficult than it really is because you're asleep for eight to nine, maybe even 10 if you're lucky, hours of that. So it's really not as bad. And that's the way that my body responds to weight loss in the best way. Now one of my really good friends, he needs to maintain his weight and he is not an ounce of fat on this guy. He walks around probably about 7% about body fat and that's just the way he is. He is a competitive bodybuilder. He will set alarms, if he goes to bed at nine o'clock, he sets alarms at midnight and at 5 a.m. so he can wake up and eat and that's how he kind of maintains his weight when he is trying to gain. Now he is a mesomorph, so remember how we talked back about the body types. So for him, it's gonna be a lot easier for him to maintain than a tall, lanky guy, who also is another good friend of mine and it has to set three alarms for himself to wake up during the season. Um, drink your calories, but in an effective way. So there are so many protein powders out there. I could get an entire presentation just on protein powders. Ah, oh, there we go. So supplementing, yes. Protein supplements, all that good stuff. Um, you can get yourself a protein shake. Sorry, guys. You can get yourself a protein shake, but you make sure it's a high quality one. So here's a quick math equation for anyone looking to supplement their protein, is that your protein should be 75, your protein drink should be 75% protein. So if you take the grams of protein in one serving, and you divide that into the grams per serving, it should be 75% or above. Otherwise, it's just going to be a meal replacement. So the difference between a protein and a meal replacement, Slim Fast is a meal replacement, Shakeology is a meal replacement, those are very high in carbohydrates and sugar because it's trying to cover everything, and in turn, those calories are gonna be a lot higher than a protein drink itself. And so that's one of those things where, that's another talk that we're talking about um, later on that we've discussed uh, is doing one on supplements because that could take us a whole nother two Absolutely. hours on. But the main thing with supplements is it's a supplement to your diet, okay? It's not meant to replace it. And I think I get a lot of high schoolers that are like, well, I've had my protein shake, so I'm good for the day. No, your protein shake is meant to be that filler. It is not meant to replace a whole meal. Because if you had the option between a protein shake and a steak, a steak is gonna do more for your body than the protein shake, not the other way around. Right. And you know, the protein shake in, in general, um, it is, like Rachel said, a good supplement, but the calories aren't gonna be there if you're trying to gain muscle, or gain weight, I should say. Um, effective versus ineffective protein. So we already kind of talked about that. I want you guys to do a higher quality protein shake if you are doing a protein powder um, versus something that really isn't as beneficial, like a slim fast. Um, yeah. And then again, the last thing we'll talk about is some prep and portion. And so we did bring some giveaways for you guys to try because the prep and portion part is so big. Um, you know, sometimes taking one day to prep your meals 
It seems like a lot, but it really is great to set you up for success. And so one thing you can talk about is prep parties. Um, I think we're a good community when it comes to if there's a tragedy, a lot of people bring food over. Do it for your own self, where make yourself like a bunch of uh, meals, but then get in touch with some of your friends that you can exchange. So instead of prepping some stuff just for you, work together so that you can have a couple different options. Um, portion out your to-go meals. And so that's one of those things, and I have some here. They're welcome for you guys to take home to try. Um, you can get these on Amazon. I got, you can get 20 for 15 bucks or so. And it comes portioned out for you. So instead of just kind of taking everything and I'm only gonna eat my portion, you can actually help stop yourself. So again, if you're one of those people that can't naturally stop when you're full, doing something to help portion yourself out is huge for you. And so again, these are free, take with. And we have a lunch bag for you over here. Um, but that's kind of one of those, again, trips for loss or gain. Loss, you know you need to have certain amount of calories to keep you under your burn. Gain, you know you need more. So it works both ways. Um, plan your snacks out for a variety of cravings. Plan to have a salty craving, a sweet craving, so that you have options for when you're hungry. Um, prep and planning can save you money, even better. Uh, they think they said, one statistic I read was 48% of calories are now consumed outside of the home. We're a very go, go, go society. However, that becomes very expensive. I remember when like drive throughs used to be cheap and now it's like, that'll be eight bucks. I'm like, what? Um, so being able to prep and plan can save you a lot of experience as last minute tends to be more expensive. Um, and again, your grocery store, even here in town, freezer and deli for quick, quick meals can save you money. You go, you buy a rotisserie chicken, 90 second microwave rice, some frozen vegetables, boom, you have yourself a pretty good meal for pretty cheap and pretty quick. Um, so use those sort of things to you. And again, we talked about the purchasing, the smaller place for weight loss, larger place for weight gain. It just tricks your mind into going one way or another. Um, and it just again, proportioning out the plate. I think that's one of those big debated things. If you're having a hard day, you need to get those whole grains, those carbohydrates, and to balance it with your protein, fruits, and veg. If it's a light day, fill your plate with the fruits and vegetables, and then supplement with the protein and greens. And so that kind of is, again, ways to kind of portion things out to help yourself out. And finally, last thing, you guys have been very patient, um, social media and apps. There's so much technology out there that's really awesome. Um, Twitter has been great when you, again, look for verified dietitians. You can get those university or professional dietitians. They always have great tips for everyone, not just for athletes. Um, there's all sorts of online platforms for support groups because, again, food is very personal and you can kind of use that support group. Um, there's different apps for food and exercise. My new favorite app that just came out in January is this Eat to Win. And I've had a couple kids at school be guinea pigs for me and they love it. Um, it's a free app, Eat, the number two, Win. You go in, you put in your personal information. We did one loss and gains. This is one of, actually one of our kids that let me uh, experiment with him. You put in your activity level, what your weight goal is and target date, and boom, it cranks out how many calories you need. It divides it out between the snacks, your meals, and a post-workout. Then from there, you literally, it tells you what to eat. This is the dream of every athlete. Just tell me what to eat. Don't tell me I need 20 grams of this, 30 grams of that. And so he can go in, boom, he's a regular eater. He could be vegan or vegetarian and has multiple ideas that will get him to that 730 calories. Um, it has all sorts of educational components to it. If you wanna get a subscription, the paid part is 99 cents a month, not bad. Um, and that gives you a direct chat to a registered sports dietitian. So something that kind of helps you through that. Um, so it's real awesome. I thought it was easy to use. The kids can use it. Um, and then also gives you restaurant options. That's the other tricky thing too, is you can click restaurants and it tells you all the different restaurants. Um, it was spearheaded by the Bama and LSU uh, dietitians, so you get a lot of weird restaurants, but you know, <laughs> travel a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> Another one out there is my fitness pal. I have mixed feelings about this through my own personal experience um, because you can put in food and exercise to see if you're getting that deficit. Um, it's come a long way. Again, it has you some prep ideas. Um, the caution, and the, this is my personal tale, is you see up and it says you can have 1200 calories. 
Um, it actually worked myself in a disordered eating pattern because I'm a competitor and I was really into my health and fitness at the time. And next thing you know, I wanted to see that gap get bigger and bigger between my food. And so I wasn't seeing the results I wanted to go see a registered dietitian. She's like, well, you're malnourished. Um, so this is one I, I kind of have a just be cautious with. Um, the one bad thing about it is you have to input every workout you do and you have to input every piece of food you eat. And so this, this is for someone that's really into it. Um, but it's a lot of work and, but if you're obsessive, it's great. Um, well, thank you. We've, we went over about our hour a little bit, but we really want to keep time for you. Um, Nick can kind of, I want him to come up a little bit, kind of talk about how we can all work together as a group when it comes to our health. So I'll let him First off, take a thank few you to both of these two. They're both awesome. Here. Uh, we're very lucky in a small town community to have such a, a good health web, as I like to call it. We have uh, Dr. Newburn here. Uh, he's uh, one of our physicians, a uh, newer physician, really a sports-oriented guy, so a great resource for all of us here in the community and the hospital. We have a uh, new health coach here, Ansley, and I, I will butcher the last name, and so I, I better let her uh, say that. Uh, we've got Alex Meyer and uh, Holly Meyergard, both doctors of physical therapy. All the, do uh, the physical therapists here are doctors of physical therapy, so it's the the highest level of education you get as a physical therapist. We've got Dylan McGill here, who has uh, just finished his master's this last year in uh, healthcare management. He's our uh, our uh, cardiac rehab wellness uh, manager. Uh, I'm our therapy services manager. We've got Brady in the back there. He uh, recently just passed his personal training certificate, as well as sports nutrition certified. Uh, you know, just in the past probably two months or so. So we're trying to get him a lot of clients. If anybody's interested around here. Uh, we've got Donna Janacek, she helps out primarily with our cardiac rehab and uh, wellness groups as well. Um, again, great resources we have in the community. All of us have a good chance to work together. Um, so that's that's it. Rachel here, I, I talk to her, I would say almost weekly, uh, pr pretty often. Uh, we've had a lot of back and forth between different athletes that she's had that uh, have just, you know, either something I've needed help with, she's needed help with. I mean, I, I think the biggest thing in any part of life is don't be too proud to admit you don't know it all, you know, and I, whether that's, you know, we, I kept hearing over and over, consult your physician, consult everybody, you know, everybody's got their little slice of the pie, whether it's a, a nutritionist, a dietitian, an athletic trainer, PT, physician, it doesn't matter, you know, to find that resource, ask those questions, the questions are what makes you have all the power, I mean, if you're silent, it's, it's mostly your fault then, if you're not getting the results you want. Go get it. That stuff is out there. It's in your community. We have amazing resources around here. We are all happy and open to you know chat with you any chance you need. So uh, any questions, let us know. And as you said, we, there are a lot of great resources in this community. I think we are pretty lucky. Um, our family personally has used uh, SMC now for oh I don't know. Our, like I said, our dad's done all his cancer treatments here. My mother just saw Dr. Newburn yesterday, even though she lied to me and said she was going to see him Monday, but I'm still better. <laughs> and then she's going to in turn see Allie. So um, I've been to a lot of places. I've done a lot of cool things, but it is really awesome in this small town. Um, and as an athletic trainer, I think the success we've seen in athletics is a reflection of that. Because we have so many people that care. We have parents that care. We have these medical resources that care. Um, that is the reason why we have a lot of success. And I think, you know, one reason we have such a healthy community, because I think, um, you know, putting a trail around Wanahoo, that reflects on the type of uh, community that we have. And the fact that we put this on, and so many of you showed up, thank you, that's awesome, kind of reflects on really where we, where we are right now. So nothing but great, and thank you all for coming. And we'll be here, if you have questions, please ask. Um, we have all sorts of resources. We have some protein bars you can sample. 